Cleanse my guilt and pride Blood of Christ the crucified From your hands, your feet, your side Jesus, I trust in you about measuring meat. You don't know how to measure meat? Well, that's what it tells you in this verse, how to measure meat. Measure what? Meat. 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 Measure meat. Don't you measure your meat? Pound it in a quarter. Well, it says right here. <laughs> where have you been? Where it says in uh, Matthew 71, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, see there, it shall be measured unto you. Look at that verse 1. It says, uh, judge not, that you be not judged. Now we think, well, yeah, if we judge wrongly, the Lord's going to judge us for our sin. And you stop and think about what he's saying there. The word, the word judge there is the word crino, which it means to... Uh, to make a decision based on obvious, observable facts. That's what it means. Things you can see, right? To judge by sight, right? So it tells you, judge not that you be not judged. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about judging you the same way that you judge somebody else. According to observable facts. You know, some people don't know why they're under the judgment of God. They don't know what they've done. Because they're being judged by observable facts. They're not being judged by grace. Do you understand? If you're judged by grace, grace says this. It says, to him that knoweth to be good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. In other words, there's a lot of things you don't know about that you're not being judged for because you don't know they're sin. Okay? Okay, but what God's saying here is if you judge according to observable facts, you're not judging according to grace. God's not going to judge you according to grace. See that? He's not, this is not talking about God judging you righteously according to grace. He's saying he's going to judge you according to observable facts. See? Now that's dangerous. Now that'll get you under judgment and you don't even know why you're under it. But, you know, according to the, the original word there, it's saying that if you're judging people according to the observable facts, that's the way God's going to judge you. We want to be judged according to grace, don't we? Wouldn't we want, we want to be judged according to, what does James call it? James chapter 4? He calls it uh, a law of this is James chapter 2. Verse 13, the judgment is without mercy to him that shows no mercy. Mercy glories against judgment. So a person who judges without mercy is going to be judged without mercy. James 2 and verse 13. A person who judges without mercy will be judged without mercy. Two and thirteen, and um, so uh, also in John, I think it is. Let me see, John, chapter seven, and verse twenty-four. Jesus says, "Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment." So, so John seven. 24. So righteous judgment is not according to appearance. Okay? And, um, but there is a righteous judgment. We can judge a righteous judgment. It's not according to appearance. It's not according to our carnal eyes, right? But it is according to our spiritual eyes because God can give us discernment that will cause us and enable us to judge correctly. The Bible even says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, What? Isn't there one among you that's spiritual enough to judge between his brethren? Being able to judge is a spiritual thing. But judging in the flesh is a dangerous thing and a harmful thing. And it brings many of the people of God under a curse that they don't understand and they don't know why they're under it. That's what I see a lot. 
You have to repent of judging according to appearance, like Jesus was saying, judging people, judging things. A lot of God's people are under judgments. Maybe maybe they've tried faith. Maybe they've understood that they're supposed to be delivered from the curse. Maybe they've seen a promise of God in the scriptures that meets their situation, or at least they think it meets their situation. They just don't know why they're not getting out from under this curse. Well, I think this is one reason that a lot of God's people are under a curse right here. It's because they don't judge righteous judgment. You know, you can judge according to sight, or you can wait for the Holy Spirit. You, you can fear God. I mean, you read these kind of verses that help you to fear God, right? You can fear God and wait for the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom. Because you can do it. Uh, I don't know. It's not according to carnal reasoning. When you make a judgment that comes from God. It's like when we were watching, we were talking about Robert Tilton one time, and I said, in this Bible study, I said, yeah, and he's going to be the next one that's going to get caught. No, I didn't know that. And I'd never seen him uh, do, i never seen anybody catch him doing anything wrong at that time. It was just, I had a discernment of the Holy Spirit that he was going to get judged for the wickedness that he was doing. And I'd never seen him do any wickedness. I'd never seen him do any wickedness other than the teaching things and probably goofy things that he might not have been teaching, but I, never seen, but I knew that that man was wicked, and I knew it in my heart. And I knew it, the Holy Spirit was showing me. And what I said was of the Holy Spirit. That judgment came to pass on him, not because I saw, but because God knew. You know? And you know what? Our problem is that when we see something, a situation, and we don't see the heart of that person, uh, like in 1 Corinthians Chapter 4, and uh, verse 5. We don't see the heart of that person, but we see the circumstance that they're in. Okay? Now, we know, look, we know that anybody who's called a Christian who gets into fornication or gets into lying or gets into these things, we know that the judgment of God is against that, right? I mean, that's obvious, okay? But this is not the, the thing that we normally are judging people over. These are not the things. These outward moral rebellions are not the things that we judge people over. It's usually something far different. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 5, he says, Wherefore, judge nothing before the time. And here's our problem. We get ahead of ourselves. Or we get ahead of the Lord. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Then shall each man have his praise in God. No, when God comes, he can give you discernment, he can give you judgment. The spiritual man, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the spiritual man judges all things, and he judges of no man. In other words, there is a place of judgment for the spiritual man, not for the carnal man. And I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew 5, you know, that... Uh, when you anger with your, your brother, you're in danger of the judgment. But he was angry. I mean, he was angry at those Pharisees when that lame man stretched forth his hand and they didn't want him healing on the Sabbath. The Bible says he looked around about on them with anger. Orgazo is the word there. It's in both places. It's the same word. So we know that Jesus is doing something that according to his word shouldn't be done. But you know what? It wasn't Jesus doing it, wasn't it? It was the spiritual man doing that. You know, we have no right to be angry, but the spiritual man can have anger. And we have no right to judge. All, uh, Jesus said, anybody that um, calls his brother a fool is in danger of the hell of fire. That's what he said. And Paul did it twice. He called them foolish Galatians. And, you know, I mean, but, but who was doing that? The Holy Spirit was doing that, you know? Our, the dangerous thing is for us to get out ahead of God before God comes and gives us enlightenment into the situation. Jesus saw into people's hearts. Well, that was why he was angry at those women and the two I mean. Yeah. Because uh, often people ask me about, you know, about, you know. Why would Jesus do that, yeah. right? Yeah. He's supposed to be, you know, what, 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 well, you know, to get angry at the, the, the women. They were doing these people things in the Father's house. The zeal of the Lord hath eaten me up, the scripture says. Note, this happened to fulfill the scriptures which said, 
For the zeal of the Lord hath eaten me up. In other words, it wasn't him. It was the zeal of the Lord. You see? In, in 1 Corinthians 5, he said uh, in verse 9, and I know that we, we can stumble in this way, commonly Christians stumble in this way. It says, I wrote unto you in my epistle to have no company with fornicators, not meaning the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, for well, then must you needs go out of the world. But as it is, I wrote unto you not to keep company of any man that is named a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a viler or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such a one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do with judging them that are without? Do not you judge them that are within? So there is a judgment in the church. He says, do not you judge them that are within? But those that are without, God judges. Put away the wicked man from among yourself. So there has to be judgment. And how can you just put away a man unless you judge him first? There has to be judgment in the church, but it has to be according to the scriptures. And it has to be by the spirit and not by the carnal man. Okay? But there can't be judgment against um, the lost. We're so quick to judge the lost because we, we think that they should do better. Okay? But the point is, they can't do better. They cannot do any better unless the Spirit of the Lord reaches in them and puts in them a desire to come. That's why God tells us not to judge them. They've got no ability to obey. We judge them as though they have an ability to obey. But they don't have that ability. we got that ability. If anybody needs to be condemned, it would be us. Because we've got the ability and don't use it sometimes. They don't have the ability. How can they do any better? Okay. That's why I, I, I can't believe it's going on the answer because those people don't know any better. No, it's a wrong spirit against an ignorant people. See, it's what it is. Christians get into the wrong spirit, a judging spirit. This man, Paul Hill, judged a man worthy of death. Something the scripture commands him not to do, but he did it. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. You know? Overcome evil with good, Romans 12 says, not Paul Hill. He obviously hadn't read that verse, you know. And that's the problem. He judged, judged according to appearance, judged according to his um, own desires, judged according to his feelings, not according to the Spirit of God at all. That's not God's way. We're all against abortion, right? <laughs> we, we, we agree with, we agree that it's wrong, totally wrong, okay? But it's God's hand that's going to take care of that abortion. It's not me. God is well able to do that. It's the breath of that abortion was in the hands of God. In any moment God could take that breath back, he'd be a dead man. But God has never chosen in the New Testament to use Christians as a vessel of dishonor to kill anybody. You know, you just don't do that. It's not according to the word. And so, you know, judge righteous judgment, not according to appearance, you know, the scripture says. And, and in Romans 2 and 1, it, it tells you that if you judge others, you judge yourself. If you judge others, your old carnal man, if you judge others, you're judging yourself. In other words, you are going to bring judgment upon yourself. And um, one of the most common forms of judging is unforgiveness. I mean, it's the most common form because people do something to you and immediately your old self riles up and you get angry with them and you don't forgive them and so on and so forth. And what's Matthew 18 says? It says, well, if you don't forgive your fellow servant, then uh, <clears throat> the master is going to turn you over to the tormentors until you shall pay all that was due. Look at that. All that was due. You know, we've been told, and the scripture even says, that God's taken our sins and thrown them in the depths of the sea. As far as the east is from the west, so far, has the Lord removed our sins from us. But you know what? Some people think God can't ever remember again. And he can't go back and get them. You know, God can go back and get them. Yes, he does too. In Matthew 18, it says, till he shall pay all that was due. Meaning what? Meaning the judgment of your old sins has come back upon you again. Now that's what, where a lot of Christians are. You know what? The, the sins that they thought they had been forgiven of, and that they were forgiven of, the judgment of that has come back upon them because they don't forgive their fellow man. And they don't forgive the heathen, whom they're not supposed to be judging in the first place. Or they don't forgive their fellow Christians, you know. The judgment of our past sins 
we were delivered up, weren't we? I mean, Romans chapter 3 tells us so plainly we, we were delivered up. Um, yeah, because the, the law can only forgive us if we forgive those who have sinned. Is it Matthew? What is it, you know? Uh, instead of forgive us, I can forgive, right. forgive you. That's right. You know, um, God's forgiveness is blocked when we don't we don't forgive. Yeah. And we need to learn, I'll tell you something too. We need to learn to not wait a week or two weeks or three weeks to forgive because during that time we're gonna probably live on the judgment of God. God is motivating us to learn to be thick skinned. I mean just don't let anything bother you. Just don't let anybody bother, don't let anything bother you. Because if you do, you're gonna unforgive, you're gonna get angry. And you're going to judge. Three, three sins about as good as points out. People in authority are the worst. I mean, they uh, tend to exercise judgment very quickly. That's why Bob says that there shouldn't be many teachers among you. You know, uh, it's more dangerous for somebody in authority because they've got power, and they're tempted to use that power. Yeah, you know? like for instance, go back to Judges chapter one. When you got, boy, just beware of religious people when they get power. History has told us <laughs> that when they get power, there's going to be trouble. You know, there's going to be trouble for real Christians always. You know, uh, right after Joshua. It's about a uh, half an inch from the beginning of the book. <laughs> And you've got the tabs in yours. <laughs> Be careful how you treat people that you've been given power over. Because all through the scriptures. Uh, yeah, that's right. We're not going to say anything about your ignorance. We're just going to keep on going. <laughs> Verse 4 says. <laughs> yeah, it's not David. <laughs> <laughs> was that a pun or was that what was that? Sarcasm or uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they smote them in Bezek ten thousand men. And they found Adon of Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him. And they smote the Canaanites and the Perizzites, but Adonibazek fled, and they pursued after him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. Can you imagine swinging a sword anymore without your thumb, or uh, even walking or running without your big toes? Not it says, um, and, and Adonibazek said, which means Lord of Lightning, by the way. He might have been somebody who judged pretty quickly, right? Lord of Lightning. Uh, and Adon and Bezek said, Three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their food under my table. As I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Now, you know, I don't even know. It doesn't seem like they knew that, that he had already done that to these kings that he conquered, you know, that he cut off the thumbs, cut off the big toes, you know. Doesn't seem that they knew that. It seemed like he was trying to tell them that God had brought it back upon him. Yeah. See, you see the, the inference there? The inference is that God did this because he did it. Not they did it because he did it. God did it because he did it. So, you understand what I'm saying? Does anybody get that? In other words, you're going to reap what you sow. And, and his judgment, because he had power over these kings, uh, his judgment brought the same back upon him. You know? Um, you know, in Esther, I mean, Haman was hanged in Esther chapter 7 on the same uh, gallows that he'd made Mordecai. And um, and his sons were hanged too, by the way. His sons were hanged too, by the way. And look at Deuteronomy 19 and 19. Hmm? I guess I'm with this Well, the more the more we study it, the more we have the fear of God, and the more we have the fear of God, the less we're going to do it. I was going to get my mother to say it now, David. 
I mean, we're going to fear God. Into the fear God. Depart from evil. That's what it says. Yeah. But you think you have, and all of a sudden it rises back up again. Deuteronomy 19 and 16. Deuteronomy 19 and 16. If an unrighteous witness rise up against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both of the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, and before the priests and the judges that shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness be a false witness, and have testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do unto him as he thought to do unto his brother. So, so shall thou put away the evil from the midst of thee. And those that remain shall hear and fear. That's why we're reading this, so we can hear and fear, right? And shall henceforth commit no more any such evil in the midst of thee. And thine eyes shall not pity. Life shall go for life. In other words, if, if he had brought a false witness against his brother that would have brought him to death, would have brought him to execution, then you're to execute that man. Okay, that's the way it was in the Old Testament, right? An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and a hand for a hand, and a foot for a foot. A lot of people don't know where that comes from, but look what it's talking about here. It's talking about doing this to an unrighteous witness who thought to do this to somebody else. In other words, they judged somebody else. They lied and they brought judgment against somebody else. But they lied. And God says, okay, you give to them what they thought to give to somebody else. Okay? You know, when we misjudge somebody, it's, it's because we consider them worthy of judgment. And, and it's because we consider them worthy of judgment by what we see, not by what the Spirit has spoken to us, right? And so, God is saying, with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. There you go, measure at me again, right? So, so, however we measure it out to others, God says, it's going to be measured back to us the same way. I, I think that we need to know, we need to know really down in our hearts that we're going to be treated the way we treat others. Uh, when we miss and we unforgive and we're bitter and we're angry and we judge others, that it's going to come back upon us. And sometimes it's not according to righteousness. You think, well, I don't deserve this. I didn't do anything. You see what I'm talking about? If you judge somebody according to sight and not according to righteousness, then that's what's going to happen to you. You'll be judged according to sight and not according to righteousness. You in your own mind will be saying, I don't deserve this. Because you, you know what you're thinking is. You understand what I'm right, saying? Yeah. And so it'll come back upon you and you say, why is this happening to me, Lord? I believe the word. Yeah. I understand that I'm delivered from the curse. Why is this happening to me? Okay? So there's got to be a reason, right? Well, we create our own future. The Bible says it over and over. We create our own future. You know, what you loose on earth is loose in heaven, and what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. We create our own future. In other words, but, that the circumstances in the earth. Right. By what we measure out, it's going to be measured back to us. In other words, this is this could confuse you just enough where you're not sure so that you won't judge until the Lord speaks to you. Well, maybe that's what the word wants to do there. And that, and that no, is, you know. it it's that's right. To... You can judge according to appearance. Job's three friends did. The fourth guy judged according to the Holy Spirit, but the first three didn't. They judged according to appearance. Job, this is happening to you. You must have been a bad fellow. You must have done something wrong. <laughs> it makes you. It makes you quick to hear and slow to speak, doesn't it? Well, do you know, do you know that either that that could be a reason for somebody to judge as quick as if a person was proud? You know why? A lot of people, when they're down, they want everybody else to be down. You know why? Because look, if everybody's down on my level, God surely couldn't judge me, could He? I mean, He does. Well, of course He does. Of course He does. But that's the way our carnal thinking goes. You know, uh, a lot of people do that. That the reason they try to tear everybody else down. It's because they're down themselves, and they know it. He's doing this to deliver us from self-righteousness, you see. This warning is to deliver us from self-righteousness. It's to cause us to fear God so that we'll give up being self-righteous about other people. 
Let's face it, you're never going to get along with anybody. You'll never have peace with the people around you until you give up self-righteousness, right? So that's what God's out to do, destroy in us self-righteousness so that we'll be humble and meek around other people. And we won't be quick to judge, and we won't, you know, have prickly spines sticking, sticking out of us all over, you know, like a porcupine, you know. Uh, uh, there's other places that this measuring meat is, is in the scriptures. Let me point another one out to you. In uh, Mark chapter 4, and verse, um, uh, verse 23. If, if any man, Mark chapter 4, verse 23. Any man has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you, and more shall be given unto you. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken away even that which he hath. So now what's he talking about? Before he was talking about judging. You measure, you meet his measure <laughs> according to how you judge, right? Now he's talking about uh, hearing, right? Let's face it, we do the way we hear, don't we? And he tells you, look, be careful what you hear because however you measure it out, it's going to be needed to you again. Be careful what you hear. You know what? Stop and think about some self-righteous preachers who put that same spirit in other people, that they run around judging everybody and everything. Have you ever run into that? You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Pretty easy. So you know what? Those people should be careful what they hear, right? Like like Brother Paul Hill. You know, I don't know if he's a brother, but he's obviously a preacher. If he'd have been careful about what he'd heard, he wouldn't have done what he did, would he? First of all, what did he hear? Well, he at least heard his emotion, and he heard his self-will, and he heard what his little group thought, but did he hear the word? No, he didn't hear the word. He couldn't have done that. If he'd have heard the word, he would have resisted not him as evil, wouldn't he? See? So what Jesus is saying is be careful what you hear. You know, you can get around people whose uh, emphasis is judging, whether it be according to religion or doctrine or whatever. Their emphasis is judging. You know what? You'll be the same way. If you're around critical people, that spirit can get in you. Oh, no. So Jesus said, be careful what you hear, because with what measure you meet, it will be measured unto you again. So if I have you measured out to others, it's going to be measured back to you in that same way. It's happening with Paul Hill. And look at it. See what happens. See? Uh, that's God. That's God. God brought his own judgment there. And it happened to the abortion doctor, too, I might add. What, what measure he needed, it was measured to him again, too. You know, he got what he deserved. He got justice. He got it from the hand of God. He just got it through a vessel that that vessel should not have put himself in a position of being a vessel of wrath. He missed it right there. But God will use whom, whom he will. He'll use who make them, the people who make themselves available. He made himself available, and God used him. But he's wrong with what he did. Do you know what that next verse is talking about? It says, For he that hath, to him shall be given. Verse 25. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken away even that which he hath. That's Mark 4 and 25. You know what he's talking about there? I looked in one of the other Gospels and the emphasis is even, is even stronger. What he's talking about is hearing. If you've got hearing, you're going to receive more from the Lord. But if you don't, even that what you have is going to be taken away. In other words, the lukewarm are going to be thrown out. The fence is going to get wider and wider between the righteous and the wicked. And people are going to hear, and they're going to hear good, or they're not going to hear at all. And a person who don't want to hear, they're going to lose the hearing that they do have. The closer we get to the end, you're going to see this. There's going to be a greater and greater divide between the righteous and the wicked. Because God's going to take the, the little bit of hearing that people have that don't want to listen, away from them. There's going to be a reprobation. There's going to be a spewing out of the lukewarm, you see. That's God's judgment on people. So, what he's talking about here is hearing. If you've got hearing, 
In other words, if you've got hearing for the Word of God, not for man, not for other people, you know, uh, but for the Word of God, if you've got that, you're going to get more of it. But if you're weak in that area, and you're not, if you're just a hearer and not a doer, you know, then you're not really a hearer, not a hearer in the Spirit anyway, then God's going to take away even that little bit what you got. There's another place in that God's talking about measuring the meat. <laughs> Okay? In, in Luke 6 and 38, look at uh, verse 38. It says, I want you to notice, we've looked at three different things here that he's talking about measuring meat. Okay? Verse 38, he says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall they give unto your bosom. For... With what measure you need, it shall be measured unto you again. So, this can be a positive thing too, right? right yeah. The way you measure out to others can be the way you get blessings, right? The way you get blessed. And I'm sure that this is not talking about just money, but you can give, you can give kindness, you can give love, you can give mercy, you can give, you can be a giver of all the attributes of Christ to other people. And, uh, and God says it's going to come back to you. It's going to give you more. And if you, the more you give, if you're a bountiful sower, you're going to be a bountiful receiver, according to what God said. Okay? You know what? I really believe, I believe it's like you said, Eva, this measuring and receiving covers everything. Not just the three things that it points out in the Scripture. For instance, look at this text. Go back to verse um, verse 30. It says, Give to everyone that asks of thee, and of him that takes away thy goods, ask them out again. And as you would, and as you would, that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise. That's clear, ain't it? Okay, in the text between that verse and the verse where he's talking about measuring out and receiving again, he talks about forgiveness, he talks about uh, giving, um, he talks about releasing people. Um, so many things he talks about. So it's obviously all talking about the same thing. You know, what you sow, you're going to reap. Your relationship with others is very important because God is going to send back to you the way you are to other people, right? He said, and as you would that men should do to you. In other words, the way you want to be treated from God through people around you is the way you need to treat other people. If you want to be treated that way, then keep on treating people that way. If you want to be treated better, then treat people better. That's what he's saying. It's very clear. You know, this is not this is not a suggestion from God. It's it's a law from the Holy Spirit to deliver us from the curse around us. You know, God wants to bless us, but He can only bless us in the measure that we meet to others. The Bible says, "Give." and it will be given unto you. You see something there? You have to sow to reap. You know, people want to reap, but they don't want to sow to do it. But God has said, if you don't sow, you won't reap. Everything you sow, you're going to reap. If you sow bad, you reap bad. If you sow good, you reap good. But in order to reap a good future, we've got to sow a good seed now. We've got to do something in order to reap. Everybody's praying, God... I want to reap. I want to reap. I want to give me this. Give me this. Bless me with this. Bless me with this. And God is telling us the way here. There is one way. You've got to sow in order to reap. It's, it's not automatic. You know, some people, have you ever noticed that some people pray, 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 and they never get anything from God? Why does that happen? Is it that God is bound from giving them what they what they desire according to the Word of God? Yeah, that's the problem, you see. God can be bound from giving you what you desire by the Word of God. He can't transgress the Word. And God has said in the Word, what you sow, you're going to reap. So therefore, if you pray for God to bless you, with His many, many blessings, whatever they be, then you've got to sow something in order to reap that. Or else, you're going to cause God to break His Word. You're not going to do it. See what I'm talking about? No, many people pray, pray, Lord, Lord, do this, Lord, do that. Oh, the most fantastic miracles I've ever seen is when I pray for something 
And God impressed me to go give something. And whether it be something physical, tangible, love, or whatever. You know? uh, have you ever done that? The biggest miracles I've ever seen is when I, sit, I prayed for something and then God gave me the condition, okay, you go do this. And I, hey, we, I had to get, in order to get this house, God told me to give my house. Right? And that car out there, God told me to give my car away to get that car. You see? And many times my bills are paid that way. I had to give what I had left in order for God to send the money to pay my bills. That happened, happened to me many times. You've got to sow to reap. And we, we are asking God to break his word. People say it's faith, it's faith, it's faith. If you got enough faith, it'll work. Well, you can't have enough faith to make God break the word. You can even do it. You know? So it's faith and something else, right? Faith about works dead. So it's faith and sowing a good seed, right? Everybody see that? So we got to remember that. I mean, we studied faith here a lot. We believe in faith, right? Okay, it's in the Word. It's clear. And but you can just exercise faith, exercise faith, exercise faith, and still fail. So if you haven't done anything with the faith, you got it. You got faith. Let's see it in your works. That's what James said. Then faith. Is. You know, if you've got faith that God's going to supply your needs, then that little bit that you got in the bank or whatever that don't mean nothing, does it? Prove, prove that you've got faith that God's going to meet your need in the future. Don't give that to somebody that you see has a need. You see what I'm talking about? If you really got faith, you can do something, right? If you don't have any faith, well, you're going to hoard that because, oh, Lord, I'm going to need this, you know? The widow with the two mites, the widow with the two mites, she had faith. That's why she put that money in there. See? And it does, it's not just that. It's everything. We, everything that we do is a seed sown. See that? Everything that we do is meeting something out. See what I'm talking about? It's a measurement that we have meted out. And every action that we have. I believe it's that this measuring is done in everything that we do. And I believe we receive it back. And it's very important that we exercise faith, but it's also very important that we act faith because faith has peace. In it. I'm not talking about our own works. I'm talking about God's works. You know? So, as you would that men, for men to do to you, do you to them likewise, right? Not do it to them before they get to do it to you. Exactly. <laughs> we have to do that in self-defense, you know, because we want to do back to people. But God says you better not if you want to reap a good future, you know. Uh, we have to do what we have to do no matter what, no matter how people treat us, we have to do what we have to do in order to reap a good seed in the future, you know. Back in uh, in Matthew 7 and 12, he says, All things, therefore, whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, even so do you also unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now, this fulfills all the law and the prophets. In all things, therefore, whatsoever you would, in other words, that you want people to do to you, do you also think. In other words, that's what God wants us to do in order to reap a good future. To be blessed from people around us is we have to do to these people. We have to sow a seed. We have to do to these people the way we want God to treat us through people in the future. Look at Proverbs 11 and 31. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> it says, Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth. How much more the wicked in the sinner. You know something, a lot of people, you know, here's a little side issue here, but a lot of people don't think that Christians are going to be recompensed in the earth. They think our recompense is going to come hereafter. But no, that's not true. We get recompensed in the earth. I mean, we do get recompense in the earth. And the wicked do too. In other words, everybody reaps. Huh? Much more. Yeah, much more. In other words, everybody gets to reap what they sow right down here. Yeah, they really do. Well, um, maybe we're not as good as we think we are. <laughs> it's, it's wickedness is sown to us, you know? Hey, I'm not talking about necessarily from the person that we sow it to. It may not come back from that person. If you sow kindness to some person and they return wickedness for your kindness, it's not necessarily true that the Lord is going to bring it back out of that particular person. 
God is going to bring it back to you. He's going to bring it back to you somebody, but it may not come back to you that person. And haven't you ever received evil for good? I do it all the time. I receive evil for good. But we're going to get the good back. It'll come from somebody. It has to come, or the Word of God is going to be broken. That'll never happen, will it? We're told to expect when we get. And the Lord told us that. Some people say it's wrong to do that. But look, it depends on what you want to do with what you're getting. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're giving in order to receive, in order to keep, that's one thing. But if you're giving in order to receive, in order to sow it again, which is what the Bible tells you to do, that's something else. Some people give in order to get rich. Well, the Bible don't tell us that. It says, Seed, you know, multiply your seed for sowing. We we give in order to receive, in order to be able to give more. That's what's right about it. But if you're giving in order to receive, in order to get fat and filthy rich, you're wrong. You know, you're just wrong. But God does want us to prosper. He wants us to be a vessel, a flowing, a river of living water flowing from this vessel. You've got to give in order to get that, you see. And so it's, it's right to give in order to receive, in order to give even more. It's right. There's nothing wrong with that. It's when you give in order to receive, in order to keep. That's what's wrong, because it's not yours. It's God. But you've got, you've got as a steward, not as an owner. Right? Well, that, that doesn't even come into my understanding. Money and stuff, crazy like that. I'm talking about doing for other people. Same thing. Same you, thing. You just do because you want to do to help them, you know? Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, you're stuck in the face. Yeah. And I don't like Nobody does. Our old flesh just don't like it. That's when you can go measuring your meat right there because you got plenty of it when that happens. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Measuring your flesh. You measure it real good when that happens. You know? yeah. Look in uh, verse 17 of the same chapter. Yes, same chapter. Proverbs 11 and verse 17. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul. Hey, you do it in self-defense. Do it because it's good for you. Don't worry about them. Do it because it's good for you. (laughs) The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubles his own flesh. Let's go on with the text here. Look at verse 18. The wicked earneth deceitful riches. There it is right there. He earneth deceitful wages. It's not really riches. It's not really wages, is it? But he that soweth righteousness hath a sure reward. The wicked, the wicked thinks he's gaining by his foul works. They think they're gaining by that. But no, it's deceitful wages. You're not, you're gaining just the opposite, you know, because you're going to reap what you sow, right? He said, but he that soweth righteousness has a sure reward. He that is steadfast in righteousness shall attain unto life, and he that pursueth evil doeth it to his own death. Everybody is going to reap what they sow. And I don't care. It doesn't matter whether you call yourself a Christian or not, whether you go to church, and whether you jump up and down and you sing to the Lord and all that. If you don't sow a good seed, you're not going to reap a good harvest, right? And we do have to sow what we do want to reap. Figure out what you want to reap, and then start sowing it. I mean, that's what we got. That's what God's telling us. You figure out what kind of plant you want. And then go get that seed and shove it in the ground. Well, I think in the kingdom is the only way we can do that, really. In the kingdom, we can do that. You can have the rose and challenge Jesus. You can get a rose without the curse, right? Well, he does have another term of Well, look at 13 and 21. Evil pursueth sinners, but the righteous shall be recompensed with good. Evil pursueth the sinners. The righteous shall be recompensed with good. If we could keep it in our understanding, you know, continually with us all the time, yeah. and think of, and meditate on it, that we need to sow the kind of seed that we want to reap. And if we want to reap something, we need to go sow that seed. Whether or not we meet with a favorable act from somebody else. We're doing it because we need to reap righteousness, you know. And if you sow 
righteousness and right living towards others, you're going to reap it from the Lord. That's why we're studying this, so that we can fear the Lord. We can see a reason behind it. You see, people don't do it. People don't do it as easily if they don't see a reason behind it. What's the reason for turning the other cheek? Where does it profit me? Where does it profit me to turn the other cheek? Well, that's what we're looking at. You see. If we see a reason behind it, we're more apt to do it. And, and we're more apt to fear God, because God has said, look, with what measure you meet it out, it's going to be measured to you again. Look at, this, look at this verse here, 2 Samuel 22, and verse 21. This is uh, King David talking. He says, The Lord reward me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his ordinances were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also perfect toward him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. So therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with the perfect man thou wilt show thyself perfect. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the perverse, thou wilt show thyself forward. Or, what's a better word for forward, somebody? Unsavory or something? Huh? Who got it? <coughs> yeah, okay. Um, you know, did you ever think that David got where he was because of some seeds that he sowed? I, I believe that's true. You know, when, um, when Samuel was looking for somebody to anoint, king over Israel, and look at David's brother, who are a lot taller and bigger and more handsome, and said, surely the anointed of the Lord is before me. And the Lord said, no, man doesn't see, God doesn't see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. You know what? David had sowed a seed that he was reaping. I believe that. I believe David came into the kingdom as king because he sowed that seed. I'm not saying that, um, I'm not saying that his own works got him there. God works in us to will and to do our good pleasure. I think it's good pleasure. Uh, God from the beginning worked in David that which was righteous, or he wouldn't have been righteous. But David sowed a seed that got him where he was. And he sowed a seed that got him trouble when he sinned with Bathsheba, too. He sowed a seed. And the Bible said the sword wouldn't depart from his house. Because he did that, see? So he sowed a seed that he reaped over and over and over, too, didn't he? A bad seed, you know? And, uh, you know, if we see where we want to be with the Lord, then we've got to sow that kind of seed in the way we live towards others and in the way we uh, live on this earth, right? But we're going to be recompensed in the earth for what we do. So, if you know where you want to be, so that can see. Thank you, Lord. Teach us how to meet it out right, Lord. What can be measured unto us in righteousness. Okay? Look at Romans chapter 3. Well, let's see if that's true. If, are we really reaping what we sowed before we came to the Lord? Aren't we? Are we supposed to be? Now, I'm not saying are we. I'm saying are we supposed to be. Right? We're not supposed to be, but I think you're supposed to sow to it. If you sow the seed, we're supposed to eat the Romans chapter 3. Wait a minute now. Oh, oh no. Uh, look, 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 look. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. It says, But now apart from the law, a righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ and all them that believe. There's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus whom God set forth to be a propitiation or a covering through faith in his blood 
to show his righteousness because of the passing over of sins done aforetime in the forbearance of God. Now, that's a long breath, isn't it? But to paraphrase it, let me just say that there is a Passover. And through faith in the blood of Jesus, God passes over the sins that were done aforetime. In other words, you're not paying a penalty for those sins unless you don't have faith. See, because, you know, people think this is automatic. I don't believe this is automatic. This is not automatic. There isn't anything that comes to you that's automatic. It, none of the promises in this word are automatic to you. You have to exercise faith in it. The Bible says the word of promise didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard. In other words, the promise of God's deliverance from reaping what we sowed before we came to God has got to be mixed with faith. If it's not mixed with faith, we're going to reap what we sowed in our early life. But you know what? That man is dead. First Corinthians 5 says, that, says that we're new creatures, old things are passed away, behold, all are new. What does it mean? It means you're a new creature, you're not held accountable, thank you, David, for the sins that the old creature did. Listen now. You're not held accountable for the sins that the old man did. The old man's dead. How many people have you heard of that for some strange reason got out of jail after the king of Jesus? I heard, I don't know how many times I've heard this story. They lost their record or, or, or some mistake was made. You ever heard that? I've heard it. You know why? Because God's word cannot be broken. You are not held accountable for what the old man did. Look, suppose you, you married and divorced before you came to the Lord. And yet you're applying these verses about marriage and divorce now that you've come to the Lord. <laughs> you can't do anything about what you did. The old man did before you came to the Lord. And the Lord don't count that against you if you if you have faith. Now, how do we get delivered? You know, the sins of the parents are passed on to the children, the third and fourth generation. How do we get delivered from that curse that's naturally been passed on. You've got to exercise faith in the promises of God. You've got to do it or it won't happen. It's not automatic. We, even you're struggling with the curse from your parents. I struggle with the curse from my parents. I am, I have an opportunity to mix the promises with faith to overcome that curse because I have that right from the Lord. You see, we have, we have that right from the Lord. And so, we think what we sowed back then, we've got to reap now. No, that's not true. That's not true. Now, what you sow now as a Christian, you're going to reap. You've got to repent. You know, a willful disobedience is done now, according to Hebrews 10, 26. <clears throat> There's no sacrifice to that sin. Certain fearful expectation of judgment. In other words, you're going to reap a judgment for a willful disobedience. You're going to reap what you sow as a Christian. Not for what you did before you were a Christian. Don't let the devil put that on you. You tell him, no devil, that person that did that is dead. When I got baptized, that person died with Christ. That's what the Bible says. We did what, we did what sinners do. <laughs> we did what sinners do. That's what they do. You know who got held guilty with the Passover? The Egyptians. They died. They died. But the spiritual man wasn't held guilty. The Israelites. We're the Israelites. We're not going to be held guilty. We're not held guilty for what the Egyptians did. We got to reckon the old man to be dead. We got to reckon it time. We got to reckon that that judgment has come upon that old man and he's dead. And the only way we're going to get the promises fulfilled to us exercise faith in them. Believe them. I'm glad you brought that up, Eva. So we need to uh, sow the right kind of seed in order to reap the right kind of a reward. Like each seed brings forth after its own kind, if you want kindness from God, you've got to sow kindness. If you want a blessing, material blessings from God, you've got to sow material blessings. In other words, Sow the kind of seed that you want. 
the kind of plant that you want to receive, so that kind of seed. And a lot of people are not entering into the very thing that they want, because that's the very thing that they won't give up. Can quench my thirsting soul Purest water make me whole Let your streams of mercy flow Oh Jesus, I trust in you Though the mountains fall into the sea Though the rivers rise, I still believe For your mercy stands and your word is true Oh Jesus, I trust in you